if you're a quitter, you're a quitter your whole life. And, and we all quit in certain aspects, but if you have a dream specifically like going through the special operations pipeline, that's something I would have had to live with for the rest of my life. And more specifically, my brothers would have made fun of me my whole entire life that I went through a pipeline and voluntarily quit because I was cold and tired. And I was right. like, I refuse to mm. be that guy. Hey, Matt, I, I think the only, there's only one way to start this, and that's that I start every single morning with you in my mouth. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm awkwardly okay with that, you know? <laughs> no. You guys got to see right here. This is, the, uh, this is the future right there. Oh, oh damn. sweet. They're 300 milligrams, just in case your heart didn't want to explode with 200. <laughs> I was going to say, th this is only 200, so yeah, I'm ready to upgrade for sure. No, well, I, I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Uh, yeah. I just realized my camera's a little crooked. It's fine, but. Oh, yeah. No Man, I love this too. Where are you? Are you at the house or you're in a studio? No, I'm actually at my house. I have a, I have a whole uh, like setup, master bedroom kind of built into a studio slash editing. I work from home even before COVID for the most part. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I do a streaming thing on uh, three nights a week at night. So this is like kind of my streaming setup. Dude. Normally it looks a little better, but. I yeah, love the wood it. background. Is it Cal okay? Yeah, yes. man. That shit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. You, do, you do you. That's yes. the reason why we. That's what I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so, we're playing Hurt today. We, we usually have a third co host, but he, uh, he actually just came down with COVID, believe it or not. And so. Nice. Uh, I yeah. recently just got over it. So. Did you? Fun. How was it for you? Dude, I'm young. It, it was easy, to be honest yeah. with you. My, my wife got it too, and she was asymptomatic. So she didn't feel anything. She was oh, completely really? fine. I just had the fever for like two days. And yeah hired for a week yeah, yeah i went through it too about in june i think it was same thing i was down for a couple of days and and then lost taste i couldn't that was the worst part of it i couldn't taste yeah. anything so Me too. the alcohol didn't go down the right way you know what i wasn't feeling it so yeah. it's weird right i was switching around my wife's like you crazy i was using this mouthwash and she's like you're weird <laughs> <laughs> this is a recorded show right yes. yeah yeah yeah, we're cool, cool, job. yeah. so anyway <laughs> well hey roll. man Let, let's get into this man and again, appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on. But, you know, on this show, man, we like to go, we want to talk about the journey. So, yeah. Matt, we want to go back to your childhood. And we, we know where you are right now. We'll get back to that. But we want to go back to your childhood, man. Where are you from? What was your childhood like? Mom, dad, uh, brothers and sisters. How, how did that go? Heck yeah. I uh, grew up in a small beach town called Santa Barbara, California. <laughs> it's a quaint little beautiful city that kind of uh, has nowhere to go other than urban sprawl kind of, you know, north and south, but you're confined by the ocean, Pacific Ocean and the mountains behind you. So it was, it was a really rad place to, to grow up. And uh, every time I say I grew up in Santa Barbara, everybody thinks I grew up rich because there's a lot of money there. Mm -hmm. But my dad bought a house way back in the day and we were the weird poor. moved from you know idaho and some other places earlier in their lives and kind of resided in santa barbara california so i, I had a great upbringing i'm still very close with both my parents um they've been divorced since i was like four but we have great relationships my, my i have great relationships with my brothers i got three step brothers, youngest of all so i think that's why it made me a crazy person because i got <laughs> beat up my whole life yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I hear you. i've got three brothers myself so I, I i totally get it were you a surfer at all growing up Surprisingly not. Uh, I, I only frequent in the ocean maybe a couple times a year. I was a little, I was a little skateboarder, though, you know, uh, okay. the emo hair. Yeah. Saying, Mom, you don't understand me. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. What about sports? Did you play any, any any you know, football, baseball, anything like that? No, I was, I was a whimsical, skinny, dork, skinny, fat kid. So mm. uh, no football for me. I wasn't cool enough to do that. But I played soccer for about 12 years. That was nice. my jam. Yeah. 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 Which was fun because predominantly in San Bruno High School, it was um, all Mexican kids on the team. So I was the only white kid. So I, I got pretty decent with Spanish because they just cussed me out in Spanish. And it was a good <laughs> learning lesson for me. So. Yeah, you being down there in San Antonio, it's a good, uh, good skill to have. Yeah, I love it down here. I'm actually up in kind of the Bernie area. I don't know if yeah. you've ever been down this yeah. way, but uh -huh. beautiful yeah, area. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. You say you're a skinny, or not? Sorry, you were you were an athletic kind of nerdy kid because we see you now, and that wouldn't wouldn't have guessed that. That's for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of had like a weird, awkward puberty stage, I think. I didn't go through puberty probably until like 16. So I was a super late bloomer, you know, and then a lot of my brothers were, you know, athletes and played baseball. One was the pitcher and um, one of my stepbrothers and he was a grade older than me. So I kind of always lived under the shadow of my brothers, Mm -hmm. specifically around middle school and high school. So I was just kind of like a really quiet kid that played bass and dyed his hair black. And I always had a dream of joining the military. And I think once I joined the military, I finally got into that individual mentality for me Mm -hmm. to figure myself out rather Mm -hmm. than kind of define my character and presence on my brothers who were so empowered by what they were doing. And my two brothers joined the Marine Corps, so I always looked up to them. And that kind of set the course for my life of me wanting to go out and getting outside of Santa Barbara, California and, and, experiencing life and going and doing some crazy things that only I had control of. Yeah. But you're only 17 years old when, when you went in, I mean, what was, and I know you mentioned your brothers were, were both Marines, but at 17 years old, were you living with your mother at the time or your, or your, or your father? What, what side of the family did you live on? Whichever one was, wasn't mad at me. That's yeah. where I was. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> yeah. They lived about six miles away from each other. So I'd ride my bike or, you know, at that time I had my truck back and forth, but um, yeah, I, I I knew that college wasn't right for me at the time. You know, I ended up graduating, but I knew that it wasn't right for me. And I don't know if that was just me convincing myself to be, to join the military, but I I wanted to serve my country from a very young age. And I, there's this like problem, not a problem, but Santa Barbara like traps a lot of people because Mm -hmm. it's such a nice town. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be the guy bartending there at 26 year olds. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It just wasn't for me. I wanted to go explore life and do my own thing. I mean, I used, as a kid rode bikes for, you know, eight, nine hours a day, just by myself, checking out new alleyways in, in the city and stuff. And so I, I really just wanted to get out of the house and, and do something on my own. Yeah, yeah. I think that's why. Yeah. But I get it. Like, I, you know, I get wanting to go into the military, but your ass went into the art. You became a ranger. I mean, it's not like you just <laughs> one day wake up and go like, I don't fuck, I'm going to be a ranger. You at 17 years old, you became an army ranger. What was that process? Probably, tell us about that. Well, I, I looked up to my brothers and they were both Marine Corps infantrymen. And my father was a Marine. Um, his dad was a Marine. So I come and my, all my great uncles are, uh, you know, World War II vets. So I come from a long lineage of military service and I knew I wanted to join. And it wasn't really until I saw Black Hawk Down that mm. I went, can I cuss in this show? Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So, holy <laughs> fucking shit. Who are those bad mofos? Like, I remember watching that movie and then starting looking at the 75th Ranger Regiment, and you see these like chiseled jawline, 6'2, you know, every ethnicity coming together over one thing just to work towards a common goal. And I, I like, I want to be that guy. And I think I was just too stupid to quit at 17 because both my <laughs> brothers uh, later in life told me that they thought I was going to fail and fail miserably. So uh, <laughs> I think I was just too stupid to quit, to be honest with you. <laughs> so that's a good point. I mean, you know, you can either chalk it up to stupidity or just an insane work ethic slash desire to achieve. And so well, I've, I've yeah, always lived like if, if you're a quitter, you're a quitter your whole life. And, and we all quit in certain aspects. But if you have a dream specifically like going through the special operations pipeline, that's something I would have had to live with for the rest of my life. And more specifically, my brothers would have made fun of me my whole entire life that I went through a pipeline and voluntarily quit because I was cold and tired. And I was like, I refuse to Mm. be that guy. Nothing Mm. like, I know it's not for everybody, but it's just not, that's not me. Were you ever a quitter before that point? Had you always kind of stuck things through? No, I stick things through probably stubbornly too too, too much Mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. They may, I mean, we, we talk about it before I was, I was a quitter for a long time growing up. I I finally flipped that switch in my young twenties and I think I dialed it up a little too far the other way in a good way, I guess. You think (laughs) this motherfucker goes, I mean, excuse me, (laughs) but Ben goes 110 every damn day. He's up at four o'clock with 3.30, 3.45 to be exact. But he went from zero to a thousand. Like he's totally the opposite side. And the only reason I bring that up is because it, I, I'm running from that person that I used to be, right? And so I'm always, now I'm always curious about people who I deem successful. What have they been like always? Have they always been that way? Right. Did they transition to that? Because that, that was my personal story. It was a transition. It wasn't always like that. Yeah, that's interesting you say that. So I, I would say that uh, you can't quit if you don't try. And I never tried mm-hmm. as a kid. 
I just kind of existed, you know, mm. and I think that references kind of having so many older brothers that I was usually just air in the room. I didn't really give anything. I was just kind of observing life. Sure. And I think growing up in that environment for so long, it really motivated me to find my own personal successes and define myself as individually successes, successful rather than kind of just existing. And, mm. and, you know, I don't think you have to quit to fail, but you fail plenty of times in life. And I think that just builds character uh, and it's what I've consistently tried to do. Yeah, I know that's so good. And, and there's another element too. Some people, you kind of touched on it. Some people are like, uh, you know, if I don't try and I fail, then it's okay. It's because I didn't really try that hard, right? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mitigate the pain by not even really giving that much effort into it. Yeah, that's a cop out. I think if you look at any very successful person, they've failed hundreds of times yeah. in their lives. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, even, even you look at it from a relationship standpoint, like how many people you date over the years and, and those are not failures. They're experience and learning lessons to better yourself and your individual self. And then being able to participate in a relationship better. I mean, 25 year old Matt could have never been ever like my, I, I would have put my, you know what, and everything, but mm-hmm. then now I'm happily married at 34 for four years because I learned a lot about my mistakes and not being a dumbass. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's part of it though, man. That's just life. Like in, in life, yeah. you're going to have, you're going to make like, I can't tell you how many times I fucked up in life, man. I, I, I just can't tell. And, and a lot of people look at me and say, well, yeah, you had a successful, you know, life, you know, mm-hmm. g- growing. No, it, it hasn't been. And nor have I done anything by myself. Like anything, it, all the successes that I, I've had in my life, whether it be individual successes and Pro Bowls and all this, these accolades, it was always someone else that was either encouraging me, putting me in, in a position to, you know, hold me accountable or whatnot. And, and I think that that speaks to, to a lot of people that are out there right now. And this is one of the reasons why, Matt, we want you on this show, man, because, you know, we're seeing your success. We're seeing Black Rifle Coffee. But people don't know that the, the problems that you've probably had in your life and the journey that you had in your life. And that's the reason we want you on the show, mm-hmm. because there's a lot of people that are tuning in and saying, fuck, I don't need to know what Matt Best is all about. Well, let's hear Matt Best's story. You know, let's hear the, the story of, you know, now you're at 17 years old. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're a ranger. Walk us through that. What does that look like? Yeah, it it was, I was just taking it day by day and I actually really enjoyed it. You know, I I joined the army, like you said, 17, actually turned 18 in basic training. And then from there you go to something called, um, you know, airborne school. I went through OSET becoming an infantry man, airborne school. And then from there, I, it's called RASP now, but it was ripped back in the day, which is ranger indoctrination program, which is essentially the selection process to become a portion of the 75th Ranger Regiment Special Operations. And I think once I graduated that, and I wrote that in my book, was I, I thought I was kind of a badass, you mm-hmm. know, because I was like, I got a tambourine. <laughs> and my unit was actually deployed to Iraq when I got stationed there. So within two weeks of being a part of 2nd Ranger Battalion, I went over to Iraq, and I had no clue what to expect. Like, they didn't tell you anything other than, like, here's your gun, you got some training, let's go. <laughs> no memo. And when I showed up, dude, I got so humbled, dude. I got oh, choked yeah. out by everybody, stuck with 900 IVs. I was, mm. you know... And it really put me in a perspective like, okay, even when you achieve something that is a massive social accolade, it doesn't mean that I'm at the top of my game. And specifically around some of the the leadership that I had, um, you know, my team leader and my squad leader, they were probably some of the most defining people in my life because they never settled for like mediocrity. They always wanted to be better, a better Mm -hmm. ranger, a better husband, a better person. And I just went, oh my God, I want to be like that. And Mm -hmm. those those guys really changed the whole entire course of how I think about life, what I wanted to do with it, the, the, the impact of just being kind to people and conversation and how you can really change someone's life with sitting down and just listening to them. And I think Mm -hmm. I've, I've held on to that for the last 15 years and just said, I'm going to do that and and hopefully live in their legacy and, and provide a little bit of happiness and laughter to a world that I think needs it more than ever right now. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's, that's interesting. You say it was mentors that kind of gave you that, that ego check, you know, cause both Darren and I played ball and, and coaches, that's what coaches were for us. So were these guys, you know, was it intentional, you know, things that they would teach you or was it more just, you just saw how their actions and that's kind of how you learned through it. I think it was, it was a product of both. I think that just who they are as humans or were as humans and then, 
their coaching style because you know a team leader and squad leader their whole job just like if you're the rookie on the football team they got they got to teach you the lay of the land mm-hmm. you know show you the best training ways and, and all of that stuff and y- you know when you become a good team leader which i would hope i was um that wasn't just me de- being hopefully decent at my job that was years of being conditioned and mentored and trained by people that were way more badass, way cooler than me, Mm -hmm. way better at their job. And I just kind of absorbed their traits and applied them to my own leadership style. And so even though you do some good stuff in life, it's not like we were talking about earlier, necessarily an individual success. It's years and years of being mentored by positive influences in your life. And not to get all preaching motivation, but I see a lot of people stuck in life and I'm like, bro, you got to change your fucking circle. You're bound a bunch of negative people Mm -hmm. that, don't want you to be successful because mm-hmm. they want you to live in this little box or this, you know, soundboard of negativity. Just get the fuck out of there and go mm-hmm. be alone and find someone that's like, that's awesome, man. I'll help you out with that. And yeah. it, it, it changes the whole, whole psychology of life when you're around good people. Man, do me a favor. I, I just need this right now. I, I, yeah. Define in your mind, and you've been, again, you've had mentors in your life. You've had to lead yourself. Define what in your mind is leadership. Okay. I think leadership is, it's, it's tough love, right? I think it's making sure people are, um, whatever their actions are that they, they own up to them for good or for worse. And then mentoring people in a specific communication style that is appropriate to them. And I think the same thing that I had to do in Ranger Battalion that I do in business is like, I can't, I can call it, let's just call it radical transparency. I can communicate certain ways with people on my team. Like, Hey, you're being a jackass right now get the fuck here on time. Mm-hmm. I can't do that to some other guy. I kind of got to like play a little soft, mm-hmm. you know, be like, Hey, the importance of the team is that you're here and you're, you know? And so I think leadership is being able to communicate and inspiring people and influencing them to be great at what they are and yeah. the best version of themselves rather than breaking them down. And also understanding that core competencies and everything in life matter the most, at least in my opinion is a wide receiver isn't going to be the best linebacker, right? Right. Two way different jobs. Mm -hmm. And you have to, as a leader, figure out how the puzzles fit together to make the best team. And yeah. There we go. Like that. No, that's, (laughs) yeah, no, that's really good because what you're speaking to is emotional intelligence, right? Understanding that one person, the way you got to coach one person is, is not, you can't, unfortunately, it's not a cookie cutter process. You're going to have to adjust based on the individual that you're talking to. And that's, Man, that's great to hear that you have that perspective. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with the mentors and and the way that they coached you throughout that, the Army Ranger. So how hard was it to go, if I'm tracking the story correctly, you went in, you know, as a young punk kid, and then obviously you did well enough to become a team leader. So how hard was that transition to go from peer to now superior, for lack of a better term? I wouldn't necessarily say it's difficult. It's just staying true to the grind. You know, I always wanted to be a team leader and you had to go to ranger school to become, you know, a team leader did that past. And it, it was more just, you know, grinding it out to mm-hmm. be honest with you. And, and I really enjoyed it. It was probably the most influential like environment that I've ever been was being a team leader because you have a group of guys that are solely reliant on your leadership to save their life. And there's something very profound about that because probably similar to the football field, I think there's so many parallels between pro sports and the military experience of that team. But when you're the guy on the ground and you're leading up to an objective, you're number one in the stack, that whole stack relies on you to make calculated critical decisions in split seconds that are the difference between John seeing his girlfriend and, you know, and his family back home or flying back in a casket. And it, to me, I took that very, very seriously because the only reason I'm alive is because I had great mentors that were willing to put themselves in front of me and, and, you know, essentially mm-hmm. be true leaders to the end. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about it. Cause based on our research and we could be totally off about this, but just, <laughs> just from your story, it seems like transition seems to be a big theme in your life. And so yes. you go from army, how long were you in the, the, the army exactly? Four years, four years. Okay. So you go from that, big time badass army ranger and now you transition out same thing with us we transitioned away from football and it, and it was a very difficult transition how did you handle that transition what was that like and how you? old were you during that transition 
So I was about 23 when I got out of the military mm. um, and I handled it terribly. <laughs> not Same here. Of necessarily <laughs> depressive. I just had a classic case of not knowing what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, I was going to be a career army guy. I really was. And I kind of got influenced by the grass is greener on the other side thing where all my friends that I went to high school with were out, you know, in Los Angeles and partying and hanging out with girls. And I'm, I was just used to being deployed most of the time and flying around in helicopters. And I didn't really appreciate what I was doing as much as I probably should have while I was in the military mm -hmm. until I got out. And then when I got out, I went, Oh my God, I absolutely hate this. Cause there was no purpose. I had no motivation to do anything. I was just existing. And it made me feel like before I joined the military that I was just hot air in a room I wasn't doing anything and yeah. I, I hated it. And I self-medicated with alcohol for a while. Finally, it was like, I need to go to college and, and thank God, you know, I have some really amazing friends from Ranger Battalion who got out and pretty much Trey, I, I, I owe him my life, called me, my best friends and just said, you're being a pussy. You need to go do something. Yeah. And after that phone call and I put that in my book, I quit my job. I moved out of Los Angeles, dumped my girlfriend, drove back to Santa Barbara, moved into my dad's bedroom that I grew up in. And I was like, shitty little bedroom. I'm like, well, time to figure out my life. And I wow. started completely from ground zero with like $40 in my bank account. Wow. And that was like 2010. Based so, off of that one phone call? One phone call. Good. I mean, nice. he's one of my best friends. That's forever, a great friend. Then, yeah. yeah, he's a great friend. Man, yeah. man, yeah. No, that's again. I hate to keep paralleling because this is not about us. But that, I mean, I, I went through a very similar struggle because you you have this goal. And we've talked about it before, but you have this goal for so long, and you think this is what I'm going to do. This is who I am, and this is what I do. And then when it's gone and it's taken away from you, or you choose to leave, all of a sudden you're kind of stuck and you don't really know. So you mentioned a second ago that that you believe that you were going to be. Uh, career army what, what was the reason for the for the transition then it was you know a couple emotional components as far as some leadership that I had in the military at the time and I, I thought that I don't know some it's a, that's too long of a story but I, I, sure, I yeah. got a little emotional about what I was doing and then I had influences outside of the military that were like you've done enough dude just come on get out come mm -hmm. on come time to have fun and I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And really probably within three months, I went, oh my God, what did I do? Mm. And I, I literally called back. I was like, can I get back in the army and go back to the unit? They're like, no. Like, <laughs> so what did you go through in, in your father, in that bedroom? I mean, you said you moved back into your father's house. What what was the the mindset? What do you mean? Were you starting to list things out that you needed to accomplish in your life? Was it, What was the starting point for you to press go and transition? Well, I, I really just, you know, put process behind what I wanted to do. Step one was I had to have some source of income. So I got a crappy job um, and I knew that was temporary, but it was enough to put gas in my truck and eat a cheeseburger. Um, <laughs> so that was step one. Step two was what were kind of my future lifelong goals. And I wanted to get back overseas. I wanted to be around a community that kind of understood me, mm -hmm. probably similar to the, the sports, you know, arena right. as well as, I, when I was living in Los Angeles, everybody I was around just like, didn't get me. And I, and not that I was more mature than them. I just had exceptionally more life experience at the time. Yeah, and yeah. I couldn't really emotionally comprise what that meant. I just knew it didn't feel right to me. And so that kind of influenced me to go, I want to get back into that section of service to feel that purpose mm -hmm, again. Mm -hmm. And when I put on my body armor, you feel like you're just doing something important. And so I literally... Uh, put a packet in to rejoin the military to go SF. And then I applied to, uh, to be a contractor with the CIA and uh, the agency picked me up first. And then within about six months after my clearance, I was uh, redeploying. Yeah. H how good did that feel to go from stuck, not sure what's next to all of a sudden having a purpose again and having a, a direction? How, how good did that feel in that moment then? I mean, it was euphoric. I think right when I went through the training pipeline to do that, that job, I, you know, day one around the guys, I was like, oh, I missed mm. this so much. It's <laughs> been two and a half years, like two years or whatever it was. I, I just missed it. And I knew that I'd ride the made, made the right decision for that moment in my life. And I was like, okay, cool. And then from there, I was kind of inspired again. And then I put myself through college yeah. and then I started doing all these other things because I was in a positive mindset. And that really influenced me to like do all this other crazy stuff I've done in life rather than 
sitting in my dad's basement, just being like, I'm content with bartending. And again, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. It just mm-hmm. was not for me. Right. Sure. Right. So now you're a contractor, right? So are you back? Are you all over the world or where are you located? Where, I mean, I know you probably can't talk specifics, but was it a lot of travel going on and you seeing the world at that time? Yeah. Predominantly the job I had was in combat zones. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I was between Iraq and Afghanistan a lot and a few other places. But I mean, I worked a lot that first couple of years. I was deployed almost 10 months out of the year mm-hmm. in multiple deployments. So I was going over for like, you know, three months, coming home for two weeks, going back for three months. And it was at that point, I thought, let's just save up some money because you get paid a decent salary. And then, I mean, I ended up doing that for almost five years. Mm-hmm. But what is that like, though? I mean, look, man, you're... you're for what you've been doing throughout those years, that, that's only a small, I mean, what's the percentage of people that have ever experienced what you've experienced? So yeah. what is and, and from, from us, you know, we see those things in movies or on the news and, you know, we just capture just glimpses of, of that world. But there has to be this mindset of you having to overcome a lot of those fears. I mean, it's not like you just walk out there and you do what I mean, there's I'm trying to figure out how, how do I say this? And, and, and in a way of, of, of really understanding, like, give us an understanding of what your mind went through when you had to go and, and either battle or serve your country in, in certain ways. Yeah, I, I think everybody deals it with a different way. I, I, at least in the Army, there was a while where I think that youthful stubbornness, I thought I was invincible. And I was like, I'm the greatest thing ever. No, <laughs> Nobody can kill me. And then you start to see casualties of really talented good guys at their Mm -hmm. job and then that kind of changed my whole thinking at least when I was in the military to I'm most likely going to get severely injured or die especially back in the surge days Mm because we're hitting a lot of targets and once I did that I kind of had this kind of I don't know fatalistic understanding of life that I'm going to die but might as well do what I die doing what I love Mm -hmm. and I just accepted that and mm. I think since then, that's kind of what I've carried through life that I'm kind of on borrowed time at this point. So any opportunity I have to create some happiness or laugh and inspire people, then that's a moment that I shouldn't even have ever been able to have. And I'm just thankful for it, yeah. to be honest with yeah. you. That sounds lame, but it's no, true. not mm. lame at all. Yeah. No, not, so let's talk about that second transition then from CIA to, to uh, at some point in there, you became, you know, you got into YouTube. And then at some point also you met up with Evan and, and y'all started Black Rival. So talk to us about that right. second transition. Well, the thing with, uh, it was interesting because I, probably movies make it sound way cooler. Um, <laughs> you know, the job I had, you know, in retrospect is a pretty cool job. But at the time I was like, this is boring and lame. <laughs> um, even though we're going out and doing stuff, it, it wasn't like being in a special operations mm-hmm. direct action unit, like completely different. Um, and you found yourself kind of having really structured timelines as far as work. And I'd never had that before. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times through the evenings and the mornings, I wouldn't have anything to do. And a lot of guys would play Xbox. And so I put myself through college. And then once I freed up that time, I kind of just sat around and go, well, what do I want to do? I just don't want to burn time. I want to do something creative. I've always kind of been an artist. Uh And I started, you know, playing around on my little, um, my MacBook and hooking up my guitar and singing stupid songs and sending them to my friends and, you know, call my brother lame and making a song about it. And he would laugh. I was like, maybe I should just put something out on YouTube. And I never, never wanted or expected to be like a YouTuber. Uh Uh, But I think that process of just, you know, uh, using art as a, as a way to like vent really became such a powerful vessel for who I am and really help, help me get to where I am today. So talk to us about that because we were talking before the show. I, I still remember my first YouTube video that I watched. It was 2006 and it was Grape Lady. I don't know if you remember Grape Lady. Uh, the lady that was stomping out the grapes and she falls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first. So what was YouTube like when you first started? Because you said you never thought you'd be a YouTuber. So what was it like back then? Well, I was a huge fan when I worked executive protection in Los Angeles before I was a contractor. I used to watch, you know, these, these guys like Rocket Jump um, Freddie Wong, Corridor Digital, and they just made really cool action stuff. And I always watched it and I loved it. And I loved the process of filmmaking. And then it really wasn't until Jared Taylor, I met him, that I realized the format to construct music is exactly the same to construct video. It's yeah. just a different 
process. Instead of audio layers, you're doing visual layers. And once I figured out that out, I said, wow, all this comedy stuff I've written for years and never did anything with it for music. Now I could put this into, you know, video and hopefully make people laugh. And I think early on, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that until I think it was about how to be an operator Mm -hmm. that I was like, I know the military experience very well, might as well use that in a satirical nature. And then that's when like overnight yeah. I kind of became a right. YouTube guy. Do you, so, go ahead. Well, as I said, do you know how many, I'm just curious, just being a geek, YouTube geek, but did you know, do you know how many subscribers you had at that point before that video? Oh, I, I think I had around 15, 20,000. So yeah. I mean, oh, okay. So you had a, you had a pretty, I mean, you had a decent following then at that point. Yeah. I mean, that was just from doing other stuff, but right, yeah, it right. wasn't until that one that I kind of found the cadence of what right. I wanted to do because at the time, you know, YouTube and military was very like, I'm a badass. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> and there's a, there's a place for that for sure. sure. But I think a lot of the experience in the military of the team room joking and all the shit talk we do is, yeah. is lost because they're like operators are operators. And you're like, no dude, we're in the team room. Like talking making, shit, making dick yeah. jokes, <laughs> you know, slapping asses, you know, like you know, taking batteries out uh, of optics and then right before you getting on the bird, you'd be like, Hey, there's no double A's in here. You're like, what the hell? Like, obviously <laughs> nothing that would get anybody sure, hurt. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're having fun. I'm sure just like in sports. As, so yeah. Like, and that's what, that was the joy, man, in, in sports and being in the locker room was to be able to, and that's the thing I missed most yeah. about, you know, football was the cutting up in the locker room. So when yeah. you, when you started this, this, this YouTube when, and getting involved in social media, how much of your, from your old teammates, your old boys, um, how much shit talking were you getting yeah. back back at you? Well, it was, it was actually pretty awesome. And I think I've only said this one time before. I have to give so much credit to the teammates that I had contracting because all I was doing at the time, we were sitting around having a beer, you know, like in the Middle East around a fire pit at night, just talking crap to everybody remember this time we did this or this, this. And I just took that conversation and turned it into something that was a skit. And, and they really (laughs) helped me because I was in it at the time. I mean, I was, I was on YouTube, I think for about three years before I even quit being a contractor. Mm. So I was, I was in it all day, you know, and it didn't really start to get weird. And probably until that last year where I'd be walking around a base and people would be like, Matt, why are you here? And I'm like, I'm, I'm on my, my cool badge. I'm like, oh, I just, uh, just uh, I don't know. Why are you here? <laughs> that, that got a little weird there for a little bit. So I was like, I should probably leave, leave this yeah. job now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a risk. I had a joke. Uh, uh, we almost got hemmed up on this one thing anyways, but it was it was pretty funny because I told my teammate, it was just me and this other Ranger buddy as a contractor in the car. I was like, hey, at least we die. It'll be a really cool headline. It'll just say YouTuber Matt Best killed works for, you know? And I'm like, We'll get we'll get at least like one newspaper article. About yeah, it. We'll, we'll get some more subscribers out of it. It'll be great. Like, burn me in the street so my mom doesn't have to see that. You know, fuck. So, uh, was there any? You kind of mentioned it. Was there any thought though behind? Hey, I want to I want to grow this thing. I want to make this thing huge. Like, was there more thought to these skits than just hey, let's just have fun? Or was it literally just hey, let's just have fun and post and see what happens? It was literally have fun and post it. And I think that's something I've tried to get a lot of, a, a lot of advice to people. They, they want to turn a hobby into something that's monetizable immediately. And it took me years and years. I mean, when I first started doing YouTube, I, I never, I just literally did it to make people laugh. And then I saw the response of the community that were like, I wish I had friends like you. I mean, I was down today and I watched this video and you inspired mm. me to get back in the gym. I said, wow, there's this profound impact you can have as a quote unquote influencer and or public figure. And so that was really the genesis of why I kept doing it. And then we started my apparel company, Jared Taylor and I, and we launched like three shirts. And the whole prospect of that was how do we buy a new camera for like 800 bucks or whatever. And that, that just kind of snowballed until one day I was like, we have a legit business here. And then I realized, Oh shit. I have the title of CEO, but I'm a terrible CEO. I better figure this out <laughs> right. a little bit. You know, I'm in Barnes and Noble pulling off how to run a business. For like, I got this shit, guys. It's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're good. You're in good hands. So you're talking about Article 15 clothing, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so when you got <laughs> when you got involved, I mean, you, you just mentioned it. So you didn't have any background in the apparel industry at all. You just went, you know, head first in, right? 
Head first. Jared had a little, little experience because he ran a couple of t-shirts for his TACP kind of group, but no, no experience other than I think I would wear this shirt and I think it's funny. And then we made that. And then apparently a thousand other people thought it was funny and they'd wear it. And we kind of just uh, ran with it, to be honest. So it sounds like you're a guy that you're not going to be super. You don't, you don't have to have all the answers and figure everything out first. You're going to start and then I'll figure it out as I go. Is that, is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, I think if you start a business, right, and you're going to invest a lot of money, you have to have process, you have to have a business plan. But at the time, I was writing the business plan as I was doing it because I had supplemental income coming from my day job. Mm. And that's why it took so long to quit being a contractor, even though I, I was making enough to walk away from it, was I had to make sure this worked and it wasn't a flash in the pan. And then two years down the road, I go, oh, my God, I'm screwed. <laughs> you're, man, you're talking. Yeah. Bro, you're preaching over you, there. You said something he liked. Yeah, he, just, yeah. he just hit me in the arm. But. <laughs> because it's it's so true. It's like, you know, there, there are times, when it, you know, life is, it, it throws you all kinds of different ways, man. I mean, you, sometimes you, you have to start something. Just start. Yeah. Just freaking, you know, hit the start button and, and move forward. Because if you don't, you know, the fear will take over and it'll, it'll eliminate that, that start for you, man. You'll just start doing other things or be distracted or not. Just get going, like mm. push the cart forward and it'll take you somewhere. It's going to do that. Yeah. And I, I believe that and somewhere is better than just where you've been. Mm. You know, I think life is an ever changing progression and I'm pretty fatalistic in my understanding of life. I think we're all just stardust that, you know, it's became some biological function, you know, which is pretty legit. Um, and, and in that sense, I would, I would be so terrified to be on my deathbed with this massive unknown in the universe to go, I didn't take risks and I didn't try. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a large part of a, a lot of people is they have the talent, they have the creativity, they have the know-how they're just terrified and trepidation just, you know, bolts you to the ground. Yeah. And I think if you have a sense to overcome that strategically and smart and, still maintain your way of life, then you're going to be massively successful. In yeah. Life. yeah. You know, you're talking to me, man, because I am somebody that overthinks. I've got to figure it all out. I've got a plan. I've got to think about it. And then what this show has taught me and all these, you know, discussions we've had with these great people is that, man, just go, just start, stop thinking and start doing. So you transition so from, you got to send it, man. Sometimes yeah. <laughs> you just got to send it. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, I call that paralysis by analysis. Yes. And I met a lot of people that do that, that overthink things. And it's just like, you could sit there and talk about how to walk the 10 feet forever. Do I go left foot first? Do I go right foot? What shoes do I wear? Sometimes the most impactful thing you can do is just fucking walk. Yes. Right. Figure it out. And you're like, ah, my feet hurt. I need better boots. Now, now we're, now we're in a process of improving, right? Like, okay. man, that's so good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. So you transitioned from the clothing company. How did, where did Black Rifle Coffee come from? How did that all start? Um, it was very interesting. I never responded to emails. I was a busy guy at the time. Um, Jared Taylor is a social butterfly, bless his heart. And uh, this gentleman, Evan Hafer, who worked in the same area that I worked in, uh, sent me an email. I never got it. Of course, Jared Taylor got it and was like, oh, this guy's a former Green Bray, you know, contractor doing what I was doing. Um, a little different, but same shit. And he roast coffee and we, we didn't even think about coffee. So we ended up starting doing a startup for um, kind of building veteran businesses. And it, it was like a crowdsourcing function for specifically veteran and law enforcement and civil servants. So if you were a veteran and you had an idea, we were, the hope was to be a platform to communicate to your audience, what cool thing you created or what you're doing. And then people could crowdfund that. Um, it failed miserably. There was a couple successes out of there, but we just, we just didn't have the, the know-how and probably intellectual capacity on the IT side to, mm -hmm. to get that done. And that's when Evan just said, Hey, I want to roast some coffee for your, uh, your apparel company. And we're like, sweet. We ended up calling it Freedom Roasters, which actually I think I have about one of two bags in existence today on my wall up here. <laughs> um, and we launched coffee with a cool bag and we it sold out. We expected it to do well. But the, the weirdest part about that was everybody started writing in going, I bought this bag because it looked cool. But what the fuck? This is the greatest coffee I've ever tasted. <laughs> mm. And I knew dick all about coffee at the time, to be yeah. honest with you. And we're like, wow, Evan actually has something here. And unbeknownst to me, he'd been like working on roast profiles for nearly 10 years. He's just a coffee nerd. And then that with the social media presence, we're like in a, it's a you know, consumer package good and it's a recurring. I was like, wow, this, this could do. And then Evan went, 
I got an idea. Let's call this thing Black Rifle Coffee. I'm going to start it. Do you guys want to be on board? And that was another massive transitional risk at that time because I already had a very good business and it took a lot of my time away to do Black Rifle. But I think Jared and I saw something so unique and special in Evan Hafer that we couldn't let that opportunity go. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about, you didn't really know much about coffee, but you had some, some experience with running a business, but then even that you talked about how you didn't really know until you started. So now you've started this really successful coffee company. You're hiring folks underneath you. What was that transition like as far as now I'm a leader again of people that are depending on me, their whole livelihood depends on this thing working. Yeah, I think it, Black Rifle has been, it, it has probably had the most ups and downs I've ever experienced in my whole entire life. You know, at first it was just kind of fun. And then you hire three people, whatever. And then three turned into 10, 10 turned into 20. And then you start to realize that your employees or however, you, you know, or family at BRC is solely reliant on us to make the correct decisions mm-hmm. and smart decisions and kind of emotionally divest ourselves from a lot of the social media climate that's crazy and and i think that's when it was probably two years into black rifle that i really started taking business seriously because i didn't want to be known as the guy that makes the silly jokes on youtube i I had this i had to prove to everybody that i i know how to read and write and Mm -hmm. i can sit down and make smart decisions and it took a very long time for business partners to take me serious and a lot of that and Mm -hmm. and that's why there's a lot of ups and downs because there's people making decisions that i didn't like that were in you know executive roles and i'm like man that's wrong but no one respected my my thought and it took a long time to get to the place where we are today where we have just an amazing company the ecosystem and culture is great. We have great executives, great directors, great managers. But we we learned early, hire for culture, not for like the job title because mm-hmm. we want a cohesive unit that gets along and operates the way we want it to rather than hiring some ivory tower dude that's going to yeah. be all about process and be lazy. Yeah, your, your process is similar to, to my process as well is that, you know, being an athlete and then, you know, for 13 years of the Cowboys and then going on to ESPN, people didn't take me serious in the business world. And I didn't take myself serious in the business world. I, I just, you know, it was a part of, hey, my namesake, this is what I did. This is my identity, blah, blah, blah. And it took a while for me to go through, a, even at 36 years old, t- it took me a while to go through the maturation process for that people could see that I was serious about it. I was showing up every day. I was, you know, getting there early, staying late, trying to learn the business. And that's when people started taking it, taking it serious. And that's when I started taking myself serious through the process as well so i see i i I totally understand your growth in black rifle coffee and where you are right now yeah and i think that's an important learning lesson for a lot of people is you know like we're saying flash in the pan earlier there's certain things that have a it's an hourglass with everything in life and you don't know how much longevity you have in any career right even if you just got signed to the cowboys you could tear your knee your first game and you're out and it's back to day one and I think I recognized that was I'm at one point not going to be Matt best. I'm going to be fat best, right? I'm gonna be like gray hair. No, no one's going to give a shit about me. And so I was like, wow, what, what do I look like at that, that point in my life? Whether that's 35 or, or 60, I don't know. But it, to me, that really put a fire under my ass to go. I got to learn another skill set, especially when I can learn it internally in my own company mm-hmm. and not have to go to Harvard Business School or something. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I really, really took that serious because I wanted kind of a contingency plan to what I was doing on social media and and the business. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to, so we have a lot of young people that listen to this and I'm sure you get people reaching out to you all the time. Hey man, I'm thinking about starting this. How do I go about that? What do you tell young people, you know, say they just graduated college. They're not sure if they want to go start, you know, start their own thing or start working for somebody. What are some advice that you give to young people who are in, on that, in that path? Yeah, I think mainly it's just being hyper patient and then hardworking. And, and I think it's underrated today, but being a fucking good person. I, I can't tell you how many times I, I took the long road instead of the short road, the easy one. And it came back four years later that that person, you know, was very influential in something I was doing. They're like, you know, you didn't have to help me out, Matt, but you did. You took the time. And I think it's so undervalued at this point in society just to be a good person. 
and like treat people with kindness, even though the, the easy road could be like screwing someone over and, you know, taking their equity. No, don't do that. Like be a good person, work really hard and be patient that success doesn't come overnight. Sometimes you have to like wait for success because opportunity doesn't always come from hard work, hard yeah. work. It, that, that's you seizing opportunity. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And, and patience, that's huge. Because with social media, you see the end result, you don't see the process to it. And so you think these things just happen overnight, and they don't, right? None of it happens overnight. Right. right. And I, you know what, what I, what I love about where you are right now is that you're serving the community, man, you're still in the community, in, in that military community. Now, we we're talking about warriors heart earlier before we came on and, you know, the PTSD and and addiction and, and being and being being there for those for your old, your old warrior friends and all and not only that but boot camp campaign can you give us a little bit more color about both of those uh, uh charities absolutely so that those two are more from an individual side that i work on you know black rifle coffee as a whole you know we've given millions of dollars back to charity we work with a lot of different entities and, and nonprofits. but you know from a philanthropy side personally i i really resonated with uh warrior's heart foundation and the boot campaign more importantly because warrior's heart is a great organization because they focus on you know substance addiction and people that have kind of if i went darker and i didn't have trey back in the day to pull me out mm -hmm. of you know self-medicating with alcohol i've seen that ruin families ruin marriages people have killed themselves because of that when if we would have stopped it early on Yep. that guy or gal would have been massively successful in their life. And I think that having a treatment center only for veterans and law enforcement, and civil servants was a really cool concept to me because they weren't, they were being treated with like-minded individuals. You know, if you go to a treatment center and they go, Hey, have you ever thought about committing suicide? Yes. Well, they throw you in a white padded room, mm. take your belt, take your shoelaces. And then you just got a dude that was 18 years in like the green berets. Now he's feeling like a child. He's going to quit, man. But they don't do that there. They take a whole different holistic approach. And then the mentors there are all former veterans and or have been through the program. And it's a sense of like community and family and a support system that is in line with their kind of communication style. And I think mm -hmm. that was really a big portion of why we work directly with them. And then the boot campaign, I'm going long winded here, but no, you're uh, good. Uh, they're great because from I think society as a whole has massively not figured out the veteran experience. You know, you've been to warrior PTSD, right? That's right. what they say, right? Or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think that PTS or PTSD is, is not so easily definable from just a general perspective. If you go to the VA, a lot of times, if you say you have PTS, they're, they're going to give you antidepressants. I'm like, wrong, man. It's like a right. Band-Aid on a bullet hole. You yeah. have to put these people through individual individual treatment, figure out what's wrong with them. Because when we put them through the boot campaign, they'll like have marriage issues and we find out it's because they have 60% short term memory loss. Mm. And so now you're like, Oh, no wonder, like you're forgetting everything, pissing off your wife. And then you're upset at yourself and you're drinking. Now we can go, you just need to get the cognitive therapy. And that individualized treatment is so important. I think probably the same thing with guys getting out of, um, at the NFL Real sports, like right. the CTE and all of that. Yes. There's so many parallels in the medicine that I think we have to open up and share that, that, that science to help, America as a whole. Yeah, but that take, that takes effort, man. And we're yeah. not about effort, right? We're we're yeah. just what's the what's the band-aid fix like you just said? What's the easiest route? The path of least resistance. It yeah, takes a lot of service. effort. Here's some antidepressants. Yeah. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it, you're never getting to the core issue. And instead you're just, you know, you're just throwing throwing some pills at the problem. I agree. And, and, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there. And I think even with the, the boot campaign, you can kind of figure out what the residual treatment needs to be for that person. Like if they move back to their hometown after the military, they might just need a rad support system. So mm -hmm. it's like we, networking, finding friends that they can go, you know, shoot their bow or go play basketball, something. Right. So it, yeah. it needs to be individualized. Yeah. Is the point. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. So look, I, I got it. I was looking at the book. Uh, uh, thank you for my service. <laughs> so, what what was the concept behind that what made you think okay i need to put this book out and who are you talking to man i think yeah I, I don't know if i thought it that far through i think i just had a, like i was like i got some funny stories and some crazy stories and maybe a little motivation in there and i wanted i just wanted to share it with the world and i kind of wanted to change the pace of what 
a military book was. Mm -hmm. I think very similar to what I kind of hopefully did on YouTube was showing a different lens of the military experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why I named it. Thank you for my service was I got taxpayers paid me to jump out of helicopters and shoot guns under night vision. And I loved it. And I volunteered for it. So it shouldn't be like, Oh my God, you went overseas. I, I loved what I did and it, it molded me into the man I am today. And so it, it was just my personal perspective on my experience and then highlighting it with a little bit of, you know, yeah. douchebaggery and fun. <laughs> <laughs> douchebaggery and fun. <laughs> That's the title of this episode, douchebaggery and fun. <laughs> so one thing that you guys, and as we, you know, we close down here, one thing you guys do a phenomenal job of at Black Rifle is your social media presence. You know, you talked about earlier being a good human being. That's one thing. That's what drew me in initially was just your work in the, the, the veteran community and how you give back and how you hire mostly veterans, which is amazing. That's one of the first things. But the other thing, I think it was a YouTube video that I found, which is what made you try the, made me try the coffee. And now I'm, I'm hooked and I've been you yeah, know, you got drinking ever since. Right so, now. so how, how important has social media, and I think I know the answer, but how is important has social media been to you guys as far as just putting your name out there and, and, and spreading the brand? Yeah, I think early on it was massively important, you know, and we've worked very hard to kind of define the pillars of what we want the brand to stand for. You know, we look at it from a perspective of, inform, inspire, and entertain. And then we kind of bucket pieces of content within that where, you know, it's fun to have the veterans versus horror movies and we're shooting Jason and all this crazy stuff. But then we wanted portions of our content to inform people about, you know, nonprofits and how to profit, God, nonprofits can't speak. Um, <laughs> and then coffee and the amazing quality of coffee that we provide. And then we want to inspire people with these amazing stories of people that work for us and show their kind of course of life that it's not only us that have a story that served in the military and kind of fought our way into being entrepreneurs, that the vast majority of people that work for us did that same thing. You know, they're in the Marine Corps, picked up a camera, shot a little doc, and the next day they figured out, I want to be a videographer, and we get to hire them on to do that. And we want to showcase those and inspire people that government service doesn't necessarily have to be the post outlet after you know, military service, which right. a lot of people like me went to contract or law enforcement, which is fine if you want to do that. But we want to shed light that there's so much more for us to experience and do. And then also kind of changing the social light that if you've been to war, you're broken. And I think we saw see that a lot with these corporate entities. They mm -hmm. go, well, you've been to war. He's an at-risk individual. I'm like, bullshit. Hire right. that guy or gal. She's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, man. That's hey. Well, what's next, man? Matt, yeah. you, you've Let's accomplished so much. <laughs> In, in this short period, and life is just beginning, man. What's next for you and your team? I stare at my computer every night with a glass of whiskey, and I, I don't know yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just going to keep having fun, keep trying to do good things. And, um, man, yeah, I, I'm really passionate about this community, and I think you'll see us even more so involved going forward. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's no right answer to this next question. It's kind of random, but I'm just curious, just listening yeah. to your story. How do you perceive goals and how do you approach goals? Do you write things down? Do you just kind of think of it and, and just go for what you want? What What's your relationship with goal setting? So my relationship with goal setting would probably have to be if I'm unwilling to do it, I can't fucking complain about it. Mm. So hmm. nothing pisses me off more than people complain about themselves being fat and they don't go to the gym. And I tell that to everybody around me, I'm like, unless you're making an active attempt to lose weight or get your fitness goal, you can't complain that you're overweight and you don't like your body type and you just have to, that's you. Yeah. Right. And that's fine if that's how you want to live. But I think that's with everything. You can't complain unless you're willing to attempt to do something. And then obviously there's every self-help book out there, sure, conceive, yeah. believe, achieve, which I hate, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got to put the work in and you got to yeah. stay motivated. And I think incremental successes are the most like tangible comparatively to people that you know, just say, I want to have six pack abs. Well, you're like, okay, well, how do we get there? You have to like manage your time, time management. You have to figure out how, what workouts you're going to do and make those incremental successes. If it's, even if you start 15 minutes a day, great. Yeah. But you can't just go in there one day for three hours and think you're going to get abs. It just yeah. doesn't work that way in life right. with anything. Yeah, no, that's good. Mm. That's good. I was just curious. Yeah. So, hey, well, you have your your question. Yeah. You have to ask. Yeah, our final question. Go uh -oh. ahead. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's gonna be a hard one, dog. Yeah. Have this, another drink yeah, before you. <laughs> oh, it's just it's spicy water. It's just so <laughs> there water, you, you know? <laughs> This is the banger that we that we finish every episode with. Okay. If you could go back to any point in your life and tell yourself one thing, 
doesn't necessarily mean you go change anything, but if you could just go back and tell yourself one thing, where do you go and what do you tell yourself? Dude, that is a hard one. I think I found that answer very early in life. I said this a few times, I think, but not very often. I went to SeaWorld. This is going to be really stupid, guys. Bear with me. <laughs> I went to SeaWorld when I was like seven years old. And that's back when Shamu was real in like yeah, San Diego. Yeah, yeah. And the Orca instructor picked me out of the group and said, you get to go pet Shamu. And I was so freaking terrified. And my dad was like, you're going to regret this. And I'm only seven. And I didn't do it. And I remember mm. the feeling of the other like eight-year-old kid petting the Orca well, which is like my favorite animal. And I went, I never want that feeling again, mm. ever. Because the resentment I had for my actions was like, I just missed out on a life-changing opportunity in my own brain at sure. that time. And not that I could emotionalize it as well as 34 <laughs> that, and at seven, but I never wanted that feeling. So that's, I think, why I've tried in life with, with social media and stuff to really like tell people, take, take calculated risks. You don't take risks, take calculated risks. But the worst thing you're ever going to do is look back and have to tell yourself, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I mean, we're going to make mistakes. Oh, I've made awesome. so many, but at least I learned from them. That's, that is awesome, man. That's the, a hell of a story. I was going to say, <laughs> we've, we've had a lot of answers and they never started with Shamu. So that, that, that was a good part. <laughs> I would go back to my seven year old self and be like, stop being a jackass. Dude, yeah. But it yeah. well would have ate me. And then we wouldn't have this interview. <laughs> but, but, saying, What's your yeah. dumb ass doing? <laughs> but isn't that, isn't that funny though? Like as, as silly as that is that one moment or, or something that somebody tells you, one thing they tell you can change the whole course of the rest of your life. It's amazing that that had such yeah. an impact. I hate missed opportunity, you know, like, especially if it's right in front of your face and you don't capture it. Yep. Ugh. Yeah, Ugh, it makes me sick to my stomach, man. Yeah, that's man. man I, I love that. I, again, like I said, I, I loved it because again, it tells your story. It t that tells your story because you you are not missing out on opportunities. You're opportunistic as hell, and if you just read your bio, you can tell that fear is not paralyzing you. You're you're going to take those shots and take those chances, and I think that speaks to a lot of mm -hmm. those that are successful that we've been talking to on this podcast, man. So we appreciate your story today, yeah. brother. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll leave it with for, for if there's a younger audience, I think the, the social media climate today is hyper paralyzing because people that don't deserve an opinion will have an opinion about you. Uh -huh. And you have to think deep down, what do you want? Nothing else matters what other people want. What do you want? What do you want to achieve? And I can't tell you how many death threats haters I've had over the years. But when I get DMs from people that say you saved my life, everything is worth it because I yeah. knew that I'm acting in good faith and trying to be a good person. And, you know, you can scroll past the hundred positive comments, find the one and let mm -hmm. that paralyze you. Don't, don't let that ever happen to you in your life. Do, do you, do yeah. you and fuck everybody else. <laughs> but if, if you're going to fuck everybody, pull out <laughs> I don't, true, I don't think there's a better way to sign no, off. There. It's not. That's the way. Do you fuck everybody else? I love that. That's the name of the show. Yeah. Do you fuck Do everybody you. else? Yeah, we, we've had some golden moments just in this little bit of time. So, man, Matt, we appreciate your time so much, dude. And keep y'all keep making the best coffee in the world because we love it. Absolutely. Thank Brilliant. you guys so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Matt.